Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about doing astrophotography with a DSLR on a tripod. That is actually, um, for me, doing astrophotography is the easiest way. That means you have a DSLR on a tripod, which is, in my view, at minimum equipment. I don't have a tracking device. You don't need a telescope. And there is an easy procedure of taking pictures. I mean, you take pictures wherever you are. But that also means you just get outside, put your camera on your tripod and start taking pictures. But that also means most of the time, most of us are in a light polluted environment. So that means if we do it like that, we have to deal with the light pollution in our images in some way or another. And, then, and the last thing is image processing. And what I'm going to talk about is only what I feel is, in my case, the absolute minimum things. And I think uh, that's the reason why I wanted to present it here is, is some, something like um, uh, as a starting point for people who want to try some astrophotography or a, even a possibility to get people interested in the subject. I mean, I sometimes hear comments along the line, some people say it clearly, some don't say it so clearly, in an urban environment, why bother? The sky is so bright, we can't see any stars anywhere, why should we, why should we be interested in astronomy? And that's something, even if you don't see it with the naked eye, you can still photograph amazingly much. And uh, that's what I'm going to show. Of course, what I'm going to show does not replace tracking, does not replace going to a dark sky, it does not replace more sophisticated equipment, and it also does not replace more and better image processing. So it, that means it does not replace anything of what Dale was talking about so nicely this morning, it's actually a step before that. But it's amazing what you can achieve. So my pictures are all taken with the DSLR on a tripod, and most of the time when I'm in Pretoria, I mean most of the pictures are taken there, I'm staying in Erasmus Kloof, where we have a heavily light polluted sky, it's at least as bad as it is here, maybe even worse. And now I'm in the fortunate situation uh, as coming from Germany, my parents live there, so when I go to their, to their place, which is called Lilienthal, which is latitude 53 degrees north, and I take my camera with me, so I have easy access to the northern hemisphere, which is very nice. They also have a light polluted sky, even though it's not as bad as it is in Pretoria. And what I do is I take series of short exposures of the night sky, and I limit myself when it comes to the image processing part, um, limit myself to two steps. The first thing is I have to stack the short exposures. And the second point is I have to get a handle on the light pollution. I must create a, a sky background image containing the light pollution contribution in order to subtract it. And that's I'm, what I'm going to show. Of course, not just. Not surprisingly, we all know if you have your camera on a tripod and you stand outside and take pictures, you have two problems to solve. The one thing is we have sky rotation. You cannot expose for a very long time. You get star trails. And of course, not a dark side. Light pollution is one of the major problems you have if you take pictures in an urban environment. OK, when it comes to the sky rotation, you have to take short exposures, otherwise you get the star trails. What I normally do is, even then, I mean the stars are not perfectly round, but I don't think that this is really such a big thing. And uh, how much elongation you tolerate is actually, I think, a bit of a question of taste. So if they are elongated a bit, it shouldn't be a problem. But of course you cannot expose for minutes or something, this doesn't work. And then, if you have a short exposure, you obviously only have a low signal, if you have a low signal, you have a lot of noise relative to the signal, so you get very noisy images. And this is an example, what I have here, I and mean, the left image is just an, an area of the sky for an, ex, uh, this is a six second exposure of Antares and M4, without any image processing, just how I got it. You see the image is uh, dominated by light pollution, you see a bit, but it's not very deep. And if you enhance the contrast to see a little bit more, you see all the noises coming out. I mean, that looks horrible. Absolutely horrible. But if I take series of short exposures and stack them, then I can get the noise down. 
And if I get the noise down, then I get a much better signal to noise ratio, and then the situation becomes better. Here I have the left image. This is exactly the same that we had earlier. But the right one is, is not one single exposure, it's 10 six second exposure and stacked. And I mean, the contrast was an, an, um, an increased with the same amount uh, uh, like for the left image. And now you see the star signals are very similar, but the noise is down. And suddenly things become visible. So that means even if you have your camera on a tripod and your individual images are very short, uh, only with a few second exposure times, if you start taking many, then the noise goes down considerably, and then you get a much better signal-to-noise ratio. And then I found something, you have a bit of a built-in bonus, because if you don't track, your stars move through the field in a series of images, which of course means when it comes to the stacking or combining process, first you have to shift the images relative to each other that the stars are in the same position in each image. I'm coming to that later, how, how this works. But that also means you have a kind of built-in dithering feature. Now, when you do the stacking part, you, and you're combining the images of the same field, you're actually doing a kind of, you're doing an averaging. For each pixel, I mean, you need to take a certain picture, a pixel in the field and take the pixel value for all the 10 or whatever images, and then you take, them, take the average. Now, there are different ways of taking the average. The left image shows what you get for this field if you just take the normal average, but then you still see things like hot pixels. I mean, if you just go outside, just take pictures and don't bother about, uh, don't worry about dark images, then structures like hot pixels are still there, and I still have them in my images. And if you here see this chain, this is the 10 hot pixels in the 10 pictures and they are shifted because of the sky rotation. Um, but now, on the, on, on, the, on the right image, the hot pixels are gone. And that you can achieve if, if you do not take the normal average when it comes to the averaging part, but you take the median. Because for each position where you have the hot pixel here, you have actually nine images where your pixel value is normal, you have the sky background, and pixel number 10, which is totally out. And if you take the median, then you get a value which is, which is a representative value for most of the pixels, and if something is a total outlier, it doesn't matter where it is, you still get a representative value for most of the pixels. In other words, the hot pixels are gone. So they be, 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 because I don't track, I will, unless the uh, focal length is far too, I mean with wide angle images close to the celestial pole, it doesn't really work, but but if you have something like that, they are so far apart, then if you can take the median when it comes to the averaging stage, they just disappear. So the point is when it comes how to the, uh, uh, come, when I come to the stacking part, I mean, if I have many images, you cannot shift by hand, not even if you go into a, some program and it tells you you should click on two stars in each image, if you have 10, okay, you can do that. If you have 100, I mean, that, <laughs> that's getting inconvenient. So if you can find software which automatically identifies the same stars in the different images and is, is able to calculate the shift, which is, I mean, it's mostly a shift or a shift and rotation or whatever. So it calculates the transformation and creates an image where the stars are shifted so that for all, before you could come to the averaging process, all the stars are in the same position in the different images. If you have fine software which can do that automatically, that makes life a lot easier. And, and then also it is important that this software is able, able to do a median averaging when it comes to the averaging part. And I was able to find such a software, which is called Regim, written by a German amateur. Somebody pointed that out to me, a German amateur, in, about two years ago or something, that the software exists. And this software, you can download it f uh, from the internet. It's freely available. And this software is able to do these two things automatically. You just tell the software, these are my images. This is my reference image. Now work. And it does it. I mean, you can, normally I uh, average up to 30 images, and it does, it shifts and gives you the median image. I mean, that's absolutely wonderful. 
if you have images like I have these many short exponents. Okay, but now we come actually to the bigger problem. <coughs> I mean light pollution. And if you're in, a, in an urban area, we all know that light pollution is a large signal, different in different sky areas. There's absolutely nothing linear, nothing rotational, symmetric, nothing. It can be anything anywhere in the field, and it often dominates the images. Actually, when I started to, when I just had bought my camera and started to do the first test images, I actually got a shock. You have a brownish sky, you can hardly see the stars, and, and, and I thought, what have I got myself into? So it is really. And then we have, and have a side effect from the light pollution, it increases the noise. So we are sitting with images which are dominated by a signal you don't want to have, and the star signal that we really want to have is much, can sometimes be much smaller than the, then the light pollution, and on top of it, it's dominated by noise created by a signal we do not want. So that's the situation we are facing. Okay, that's some example. This is, an, uh, this is Orion in the east. This is a, a combination of 10 10 second exposures without changing anything in the, in the, in the contrast. And, and you see, you can see the brightest stars of Orion, but you also can see how bright the sky background. And to show it even more clearly, if I enhance the contrast, now you see, I mean, there are some more objects coming out, but you see this, it's orange here, now it's greenish here, and the greenish part, I would like to point out, the greenish part is with compliments from the Castle Walk Shopping Center. <laughs> what they did, they refurbished it two years ago with some very, you can call it as you like, I mean, it's some concrete construction, with some kind of small or very narrow towers on top, with which they painted green. The green color is actually the only nice thing of the shopping center, I think. <laughs> but at night, they shine very bright lights on it. And since they have started doing that, they have a green southeastern sky. <laughs> so the east is red, the northeast is red, and also north and west and south are also more or less red. But the southeast is green. So that's, that's what I'm sitting with. And then, I mean, if you see these images, I mean, that looks, well, yeah. So the point is, if I want to do anything with my pictures, I need to find a way to create a sky image which <coughs> contains this light pollution contribution in some way or another and subtract it. Okay, then I also said that the light pollution increases the noise, but to get the noise down, I said earlier, I take a number of pictures, series of images, so that it's with the light pollution even more important. <coughs> so that uh, leaves us with the question, can I create a sky image? And I found it is possible in Photoshop because Photoshop has a median function. Median means here not that you take the median average for a number of pictures, but it takes the median for a certain area in this, on the image. And now, especially if we, uh, I mean, if we look at this, we see that most of the area, most areas of the picture is, 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 is most of the pixels are background pixels. So that means if I take the median of certain, of, of, uh, certain areas in the image and just move over the image with this function, then I get a background sky image. And um, this I found works very, very well. So what I actually do is I, take the, I apply the median function on the image with the stars and the sky and everything. Of course, I have to uh, uh, manually remove foreground things like the trees or something and replace it by some sky or whatever. But with this median function, I get an image of the sky background. And then I found it's very useful to blur the whole thing to really make sure that you don't have any steps in your sky background. And that's basically what I do. As you can imagine, this procedure works very well if you have regions in the sky with no large extended objects. If you are at high galactic latitudes away from the Magellanic clouds and things like that, then it works extremely well. However, if you, for example, try to take a picture of a region where you have Milky Way clouds or something like that, then of course it doesn't work because the median function, which looks, if you think of an area of, this, of the image, um, looks for the median, and most of the pixels have 
sky background plus Milky Way, you also have the Milky Way in your background image. And of course, you do not want to subtract that, you want to see it. I mean, <laughs> so that means one has to keep in mind if you use this function and you have large extended objects, this large extended object, or at least parts of this, will be in the sky background image, if you do it like that. And I found the, what I do then is I just blur the image, the sky background image with the Gaussian blur with the largest radius and if necessary not only once but several times. The point is I blurred until I see when I check the background image that my extended object is just flattened out, to put it like that. But that also means that your sky background image does not follow the light pollution contribution distribution over the field. It does not follow it anymore fully because it also flattens that. So that means if you do it like that, your sky image is a kind of a compromise. You flatten until you get your extended image invisible, but that also means that when you subtract this, you will still have some contributions of the light pollution in it. I mean, I think that's something I have to live with. But so that means what I have just described as a warning, it is a kind of a brutal method to create a, a, a sky background image, but this but it works surprisingly well. So this is, uh, to give you an example, this is the image that we had earlier, rising Orion with our green southeastern sky and the red eastern sky and so on. And this is what I got after the image. So that means, I mean, I do not get rid of the noise. You see there's still noise left, I mean, yes. But you see that the sky background is almost, I mean, this, uh, the, the gradients in the sky background, the green right half and the orange left half, you can get rid of that, or at least of rid of most of that. And suddenly your image much looks much better, and then you can also see the objects in full bright. This is an example, I mean, what I just have shown here, this is with enhanced contrast. So this is now an example how it really looks like. I mean, I start with an image like this, this is what we had earlier, our 10 six second exposures, and this is the sky background image for this. And this is, I mean, we saw that earlier with enhanced contrast with all the green sky, and this is what I got after the subtraction. So that means there is a way to get rid of the light pollution contribution in the images, or at least a way to get rid of most of it. And you now, you, I mean, you can also see how deep it is. I mean, here the contrast is a little bit different. It's not that this is really not as deep. It's, it's I mean, that's the uh, same. It's only a question how, of, 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 of how to process it. But now you can see all the objects here, and you, are, and you don't have this horrible sky anymore. Yeah, so this is actually, in principle, what I do. It's not more than that. Now the question is, what can you do with this? How far can you get? Um, the first thing that you can photograph with a DSLR on a tripod, obviously, is constellations. And then, if you want to go for all 88 constellations, you need two observing sites, southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere. And with me being in the lucky situation that I go to Germany regularly, I have ex easy access to both hemispheres. And then you can try also star clusters of nebulae galaxies and Milky Way region, Magellanic clouds, and so on. I mean, there's a number of things you can do. So I'm now I want to show you some examples of my results, a few technical parameters of my pictures. I mean, I've got two lenses. The one is an 18 to 55 millimeter zoom lens, so that gives us this range here. And then I have a second one from 55 to 250 millimeters, and I found that I use the 55 millimeter of that one and also something in the order of 100 millimeters that I found very useful. The exposure times of the individual images are quite short. So I exposed between 3.2, that's 100 millimeter, and 10 seconds. Uh, 3.2 is not, it doesn't mean I do not like three seconds, it's only the setting on my camera. I can take 2.5, 3.2, and then 4, or something like that. The number of images in the series, the minimum I have is 10. But I also, I mean, you can take it as far as you like, in theory, and the largest I once used was 480. I mean, you're sitting with a large number of images. That's the reason why I said it's so important that you have this software that automatically 
shifts the image and does the stacking. I mean, that's otherwise you'll never get anywhere. Total exposure times are used, I mean, that means, uh, total means the well, how many images times the exposure time of the individual images. The longest is altogether is one hour. Then it's very useful, I found, to use a diffuser filter just to create bigger stars. I mean, normally if you just have a DSLR, especially if you have a wide angle picture, and you just point it to the sky, your stars look so small that they're extremely steep, you lose the color, and it's very difficult very often to distinguish between brighter and fainter. So if you just blur the stars in some way with a diffuser filter, you, you could just can see things better. And then my DSLR has been modified to show the emission nebulae, but uh, as we all know, even if you just get the DSLR from the shelf, or you have one already, a standard one, um, Without the modification, you can do everything I'm, I, I've seen, uh, I've, I've shown, or I will show you as a result, except for the emission nebulae. So that means even if you have an unmodified DSLR, it doesn't mean you cannot do anything. The only thing you cannot do is the emission nebulae. Okay, so let's have a look at some of my results. This is Orion, taken in Pretoria, 10 times 10 seconds. So that means, I mean, of course, you I mean, you can see all the brighter stars and so on. This is the Southern Cross, also taken in Pretoria. You can even see a bit of the coal sack here. <coughs> so that means you can see easily, even with the light polluted sky, all the major stars in the constellation. That's not a problem. Then, as I said, if I go to Germany, then I have access to the Northern Hemisphere. This is a picture taken at my parents' place. This is the Big Dipper, or other people call it the Plow, or in German we call it Der Große Wagen, part of Ursa Major, how we see it there in the north, the North Polar Star somewhere up here. So this is a picture taken over there. And then, of course, you have a very nice opportunity to compare what you see in the different hemispheres. I mean, as we all know, the constellations in the northern hemisphere are the wrong way around compared to what we see here. Or you can also see it the other way around. If you come from the northern hemisphere and you move to the southern hemisphere, everything is upside down suddenly. So this is Orion at my parents' place. This is the southern horizon. So it looks totally different from what we are used to here. And I mean, I, I find it very interesting if you can combine or compare pictures taken at these different sites, how suddenly the orientation of of star patterns, constellations, whatever, is suddenly totally different. And actually, when I came, when I moved out here to South Africa uh, in 1996, I, I mean, half of the sky I, I didn't really know, because this was Southern Hemisphere, don't see it from Germany, and the other half was upside down. <laughs> so, <laughs> then let's have a look at star clusters, nebulae, galaxies, and so on. This is M6 and M7 taken with a, what, a 100 millimeter focal length, and for each of the images I combined 183.2 second exposure, so I'm almost, I'm nine and a half minutes total exposure times. And I mean, now you start to see the star patterns here and also here. So you can, and you also see a bit of the Milky Way clouds here. So you start to see things. That's an example of a globular cluster, M55, 6 magnitude in Sagittarius. You can also see very clearly that it's not a star and you have fuzzy object and so on and so forth. Then if you try, if you go to the emission nebulae, this is Eta Carina, the famous example. We can see here the hydrogen blowing, all of that. The keyhole nebula is somewhere here, I guess. Yeah. So that means you can make all of this visible, even with all, I mean, it's all taken in this light polluted portfolio. There is a, I think with the naked eye, I have a limiting magnitude. Well, if I'm optimistic, maybe three, maybe four, fourth magnitude. The rest is just, you cannot see it. This is an attempt of the cold sack. You see it here. And if you come, and, and I found when I compared it with a book written by Axel Mellin, Mellinger, his star, this photo, his photographic star atlas, these structures are all real. You can see it also 
So it means even if there is no hope whatsoever to see the coal sack in Pretoria with the naked eye, but with the picture you can show it. It's there. It's visible. It's also, I think that's IC2948 or something here, this emission nebula up here. The jewel box is somewhere here. Mm -hmm. And so on. Then you can try some galaxies. This is NGC 253, where I combined 366 second exposures. Now you can see the disk here, you can see the bulge here. And I think, I mean, you can see it very clearly. Next to it, we have the open cluster NGC 288, which is ninth magnitude. And then you can try the Magellanic clouds. Actually, it was, a, I think the SMC was the first time when I tried it, because this is, I cannot even see it with binoculars anymore in Pretoria from my home. And this is what I got after I combined 360 10 seconds exposures. And this is the, SM, uh, this is the LMC when I did it with, the, with this one. And we all know last year we had the total lunar <laughs> eclipse in June when the totally eclipsed moon was positioned in front of the brightest regions of the Milky Way. And this is a picture of what I could see. This is, you see the Milky Way clouds here, and this is the moon during totality. And then, of course, you can try for all the messy objects. The objects which are in the northern, were very far north, I took it at my parents' place. The others I took in Pretoria. And so far, I was able to get all 110 messy objects. I mean, these are from one M1 to M11, and this is from M12 to M22, and so on. So if you are looking for a certain object. But it is possible I was able to get, as you can see, all 110 objects. And this is, takes me to uh, the summary of what I can see. I found in my images, when I do them as I have described, I can go down to about 10th magnitude. These are the faintest objects I can see. And if you have bright and large clusters nebulae in galaxies, I mean, you start to see structure. Of course, for the faint and small objects, you only see fuzzy objects, I mean, with 55 or 100 millimeters. Of course, I mean, the, the scale compared to what you can see in the telescope is, of course, very small, but nevertheless, and what I have achieved so far is, I said earlier, I got all 88 constellations, some in Pretoria, some in, 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 my, in Lilienthal, and also it's interesting if you have the same constellation from both sides. Scorpius looks very interesting if you compare, uh, photograph it from Germany because you only see the northern part, the rest is not there. I got all messier objects, and I caught quite a number. I haven't counted them, but the brightest NGC and IC objects. I have got very many of them. So this takes me to my conclusions. As I said earlier, what I've shown does not replace tracking, does not replace going to a dark site. I mean, definitely not. But however, there's still a lot that can be done with the DSLR, DSLR on a tripod, even in a light polluted environment. So I think what one can say is that, so light pollution and only having a camera on a tripod is no excuse for not taking pictures. Thank you. Does your imaging and your stacking program accommodate um, calibration files, cats and uh, dogs? No. Uh, wait a minute. You can. You can. Uh, the program is able to work with dark images and also with flat bits. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's also able to process raw, raw images. I mean, I, I only use this easy part saying I, I want to do the shifting and stacking and the averaging and nothing else. But yes, it does. Um, I noticed your focal length is quite short sometimes, like 55 millimeters. Yes. That gives you a very big picture yes, of the yeah. sky, yet you show us uh, like M6 and 7. You this was just, only a, uh, yes. You I'm just chop it up. Yes, okay. yes, yes. yes. <coughs> what kind of person, ISO levels are you? Um, I use the ISO level as high as possible. So that means um, the highest my camera can do is 3,200. Um, Sometimes I had to get down if the sky level is getting too high. 
So um, most of the pictures were taken with either 3,200 or 1,600. In the rare cases, I had to get get down to 800, but this is very rare. So I, I always set it as high as possible because the fact that the individual images are noisy doesn't matter because I will stack them afterwards. Barbara, well, uh, thanks for making a difficult subject sound so easy. Thank you. And I look oh, to get thank you. appreciation, not from me, from the Cape Center. Thank you very much. Thanks.